Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Klickitat and Skamania County's 2020 Virtual Candidate Forums. Norma? Good evening and welcome. We're recording tonight's forum. I am Norma Benson, a member of the leadership team of the nonpartisan League of Women Voters of Washington, Klickitat and Skamania County's at-large group. The League of Women Voters of Washington, Klickitat and Count Skamania Counties, along with the Goldendale Sentinel, and the Skamania County Pioneer are pleased to present to you the candidates for the Washington State Office of Legislative District 14 State Representative Position 2, Gina Mossbrooker and Devin Q. Ever since the founding of the League 100 years ago, the League of Women Voters has been a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. As a league, we do not support or oppose candidates, factions, or political parties. The league's mission statement is empowering voters, defending democracy. The vision statement is we envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. This forum is an opportunity for these candidates to present their views and positions so that you, the voter, can make a more informed decision when you mark your ballot. The State League is also sponsoring other forums around the state for other statewide offices. You can find up-to-date information on the state website, lwvwa.org. The League also sponsors an online voters pamphlet with candidate and issue information at vote411.org. And now, to, and now to get onto the forum, I introduce our moderator, Tammy Kaufman, who will briefly explain the forum procedures. Tammy has been active in both Klickitat and Skamania counties since moving to the area in 2008. She is the past president of the Rotary Club of White Salmon Bingen and has served as a volunteer firefighter and EMT is a charter member of the One Gorge Bi-State Regional Advocacy Organization and currently serves as Skamania County appointee to the Columbia River Gorge Commission. Thank you, Tammy, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Norma, and good evening, everyone. We apologize for our late start, but we had some technical difficulties on the back end, but we are up and running now. It is a pleasure to be here. So we want to welcome both of our candidates this evening. We have with us Mr. Devin Q and Ms. Gina Mossbrooker. The candidates received the ground rules for tonight's forum in advance and have agreed to abide by them. For the audience, here are a few of our guidelines. The candidates did not receive their questions in advance. The first set of questions were written by our sponsoring organizations. We'll then ask questions from the public that were submitted before tonight's forum. Candidates have agreed to stay on topic and will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. We will go in alternating format. Each candidate has been given one challenge card. At the conclusion of a question, after all answers have been given, a candidate may address the moderator by raising his or her hand and stating that he or she would like to use their challenge card to follow up on something that another candidate said. The challenging candidate will have 30 seconds to state their challenge then the challenged candidate will also get 30 seconds to answer the challenge. Each candidate will receive only one challenge card to use during the entire forum. We will have the timekeeper visual to all of our participants. The timekeeper screen will go red when time is up. If necessary, I will interrupt any candidate to complete their sentence and then discontinue their answer once the allotted time has been exceeded. So that we can all focus on the candidates during the forum, the webinar chat function has been disabled. If you have any questions, please email the League of Women Voters at the address lwvks at lwvwa.org. As with everything else right now, we are learning how to modify traditional in-person events to virtual ones. The League of Women Voters records and retains a full unedited copy of all candidate forums. If any position on a League forum is redistributed out of context to make a candidate appear to say something they did not say, or edited to make a candidate look bad in any way that they did not actually look in the original forum, then the League of Women Voters will alert the media, provide the unedited video for comparison, 
and file the appropriate complaints with any applicable governing authority. All candidates are, who are on the ballot for Washington State Office of Legislative District 14 State Representative Position 2 were invited to this forum and they are both here tonight. We now have time for introductions. The order of the candidates will begin with the order of the candidates on the ballot. Ms. Gina Mossbrooker will go first and Mr. Devin Q will go second. So now we will hear from the candidates for a three minute introduction. Ms. Mossbrooker, will you please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are running for office? Absolutely, well, thank you so much for uh, presenting this and for all the work that's gone behind. Thank you for the sponsors and thank you for being the moderator. Um, again, I'm State Representative Gina Mossbrecker. I'm honored to serve and humbled by this job. This is my sixth year and I'm a fifth generation Columbia Gorge girl through Klickitat um, Valley. It's just beautiful here. It's home. It's God's country. And we have 100 year old century farms in our family, as well as my parents started businesses, small businesses 50 years ago plus. So this is my base. This is my home. It's an honor to be here and to help people. I think the, the question people would ask was, um, you know, what have you done for me in the last six years? It's probably what I would ask. And we've had, with the help of amazing staff and amazing people with colleagues, we've passed over 20 pieces of legislation that help people. Um, many Yes Vet Bill, the Yes Vet Bill has got, you know, thousands of veterans working. Favorites are the Native American Missing and Murdered Women Bill that's gone national now. We have two bills there, autism, pet abuse, even a bill that is about green energy that the League of Women Voters um, helped also were supportive of but that was last session. I have the honor of um, capital budget projects, bringing things home that really help people. We got approved a domestic violence shelter and just incredible projects through Lyle Community Center, just things that help kids. And it's really an honor and fun to do that work, to bring that home to help people. And I get to serve on many governor task force. Um, some are in the workforce poverty reduction area. I, I serve on the sexual assault forensic examination, looking at untested rape test kits. I graduated from Goldendale High School and get to live in Goldendale even now. I have my AA from Clark College, my BA from University of Washington. I have a CHA for the hotel administrator, and then I got a scholarship for Harvard, which I'm still studying online, of course, at now. So it's an honor and privilege thankful to be here, thankful for putting this together. I know it's a lot of work. I know Sasha and a few of you did a lot of work and we appreciate you working with everyone. So this is a bipartisan event. Thank you, Ms. Bosbrecher. We appreciate your time. Now, Mr. Q, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are running for office. Thank you, Tammy. Good evening y buenas noches. Muchas gracias por uniéndonos esta noche. Thank you so much all for joining us tonight. My heart is with those being impacted by the Big Hollow and Evans Creek's fires and fires across the West. Mm -hmm. I wanna thank all of our incredible firefighters who are working hard around the clock to protect our communities. It feels like we're being attacked from all sides, whether from the virus or the smoke, our air is no longer safe. At times like these, we wanna to come together, but we're kept apart. I never would have thought my students would wish to be back at school for early mornings, full days and long weeks, but every day, Online, that's what I hear. Students miss being together. They miss the ache of flow for normal life and are worried about what their future holds when they look outside and can't see across the block. Their response to COVID by Trump, Representative Mossbrooker and the entire Republican Party has jeopardized our health and economic well-being. Not only have they downplayed the seriousness of this pandemic, but Representative Mossbrooker's prior voting record demonstrates her unwillingness to support legislation that will protect our community. She voted against paid sick leave that kept families afloat when a loved one became ill. She voted against requiring 14 days notice before filing for eviction. She's not working for our best interest, but those of large corporations and landlords. I earned this race because I saw hardworking rural families being left behind during COVID. I'm a high school teacher, not a career politician. I saw a need in my community and knew I had to step up. Until everyone has their basic needs met, nobody will flourish. Our district has seen our economic opportunities diminished, our healthcare forgotten, and our environment destroyed. We need a representative who will put working families first and fight to bring sustainable economic opportunity to our district that will move our state away from fossil fuel dependence 
and address the climate crisis that has engulfed the air we breathe. Representative Mossberger has voted against legislation that is working to do all these things. She and the rest of the Republican Party have prioritized the needs of corporations. 80% of her funding is from corporations like Phillips 66, Big Tobacco, and PACS. She only has 29 donations from individuals. We have over 160. We need representatives who are supported by and in turn support their communities. The divisive and anti-immigrant rhetoric of the Trump-led Republican Party hurts our communities. Our district is 35% Latinx, Hispanic, Indigenous, Black, Asian, or multiracial. We need a representative who believes in equity and will fight to make real change. We need good jobs and a living wage. We need to support agriculture and local businesses. We need health care. We need clean air and water. I'm running to fight for rural working families to make sure we invest in education, economic opportunity, equity, and access to health care for everyone in District 14. Thank you. Y muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. Q. We appreciate your time. Now on to our questions. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer each question. As I mentioned before, the first set of questions are from the league members and tonight's sponsors. So starting with our first question, how do you think your position as state representative can help small businesses recover from COVID-19? We will begin with Mr. Q. Thanks, Tammy. I think our state government really needs to prioritize ways that we can support uh, these businesses keeping their employees um, retained and employed. When that connection between an employee and employer stays even when they aren't able to go to work. It means when we are able to open up that those employees have jobs, they're able to put food on their family's table, and that money is coming back into our economy. And we prioritizing those small businesses. We've seen too much support going towards these large, larger corporations trying to keep um, some semblance of the economy, but their small businesses in this district are that backbone. So by focusing our funding and support to our small businesses, helping them keep employees um, on retention, we'll be ready to bounce back once we handle the virus and our communities will be better off for it. Thank you, Mr. Q. And now Ms. Mossbrooker, please tell us how do you think your position as state representative can help small businesses recover from COVID-19? Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, I started the Washington State Business Caucus and with this new pandemic and this new reality that we have, what we're going to do is focus on exactly that question. Uh, there's many, I talked to workers' compensation this morning, I talked to labor and industry, and they're working on programs where they're taking some of the workers' comp money and turning it into grants for small businesses. You've seen great work by our county commissioners who have taken CARES Act dollars and fed it directly into businesses, which is serving as a lifeline. I own and operate some of those small businesses and it's an honor and privilege. And I have, I have one business of mine that's completely closed due to COVID. I closed the hotel that I'm working at um, in order just to keep the employees safe. I, I know that you know my employees are like my family. I, I treat them that way and I respect everything that they do. They give me the ability to go to Olympia and to fight for what's right for our districts. So many programs are in the works, the CARES Act dollars, the economic development in Klickitat County and through all the district is doing a great job of filtering money into those businesses. Thank you, Ms. Mossbrooker. Moving on to our next question. Farm workers are working in smoke right now and COVID outbreaks have been linked to fruit packing. In what ways do you think the state can help farm workers during these types of crises? We will begin with Ms. Mossberger. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a big concern across, especially the Yakima Valley and even into our white salmon area as well. We have to do what we can to make sure that we're protecting them at all costs. COVID is real. COVID is something that I'm um, very concerned about for my district, for my family. And we have to do everything we can to keep them safe. We've worked on making sure that those, those farmers and ranchers that have outbreaks are able to go back to get dollars from the Department of Health to make sure that they can have the testing for everyone. Those tests are about 75 to $80 a piece. And we wanna make sure that they're able to spend that money to do those tests, to quarantine and keep those families safe. We've also talked, got a lot of discussion going on about how to test those who go back about November 1st when they start leaving our country, making sure that they're also tested and not spreading the virus globally. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Thank you. Mr. Q, farm workers are working in smoke right now and COVID outbreaks have been linked to fruit packing. In what ways do you think the state can help farm workers during these types of crises? Thank you, Tammy. 
I think one big way we need to be helping our farm workers is making sure that the, we have the resources, that they have the PPE in order to be working safely, right? Our farm workers, our growers are the backbone of this economy and our whole state. Um, so keeping them able to work, keeping those vital infrastructures running is crucial and really making sure that they have those resources and PPE to be safe while they're working it, safe from coronavirus, safe from the smoke, um, safe hours, safe working conditions all the time, not just during crisis is super crucial. I think another really important thing is be approving additional sick leave for those employees so they don't have to worry about staying home if they're feeling sick. They can be abundantly cautious with staying home if they think they're sick to prevent the spread. Uh, um, and looking to ways that we can help funnel unemployed workers to support those agricultural industries um, to allow for those people to stay home sick if they need and keep those vital systems functioning. Thank you, Mr. Q. Our next question, what strategies do you have for working across the aisle to build consensus? We'll begin with Mr. Q. Thank you. This is one of the areas I think my background as a high school teacher really serves me incredibly well. Every year at the beginning of the school year, I have new students walking into my classroom forming a variety of different classrooms. And I don't have a choice but to find community in that room. I have to reach everyone where they're at, address their needs, form those relationships and build an environment, a community within my classroom that's gonna be supportive of their learning, no matter where they're at, no matter what their background is, no matter what they believe. Um, I think that is gonna be an invaluable asset I bring to Olympia is that background of community building, focusing on relationship um, and really looking to understand people's needs, right? When you form a relationship, when you understand their needs, you can find that common ground. Um, and that's what I do every day in my high school classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossberger, please tell us what strategies do you have for working across the aisle to build consensus? Right. Thank you. That's a great question. And I think when I first went to Olympia, I was told there was a, an aisle that you didn't cross and that you didn't work in. But what I found out and what the media doesn't report is that 90% of the policy issues I work on are bipartisan. There's hardly anything that we don't agree on already. We're seeing a, a lot of collaboration. I know that um, there is uh, every single bill that I've ever written or up and passed has a Democrat online too. I, I, a bill that doesn't agree with Democrat and Republican probably isn't a good bill for my district. Um, most of the time I'm up there, I'm doing yoga with my Democrat friends and going to lunch and dinner, and they're some of my best friends up there. We don't, I don't see partisanship. I think if I do, then it gets in, the politics get in the way of the good policy. I'm there to just do the work and then get to come home. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Our next question. Is there a fix out there for re the remaining statewide school crisis in the wake of the McCleary decision in regards to pre and post pandemic concerns? We'll begin with Ms. Mosberger. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, there's a sound here. Yes. Is there a fix out there for the remaining statewide school crisis in the wake of the McCleary decision in regards to the pre and post pandemic concerns? Yes, that's a very important question. It took uh, the entire time I was a legislator battling that McCleary case, trying to find equity in education. Um, there's a path forward. I don't know what the fix is yet. I think that that's why we're fighting hard to get back to special session. We think, you know, we have a, we have a $9 billion hole in our state budget currently. We feel like we need to go back and have those discussions about how we're going to get that equitable education across the entire state. Many areas, such as home, have rural broadband, and we've been fighting to get rural broadband in, across the state fixed for years. So I think COVID has done a lot of bad things, but it's also done a couple of good things. And one is that we're going to have those discussions about making sure there's equity in access to education. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Mr. Q, is there a fix out there for the remaining statewide school crisis in wake of the McCleary decision in regard to pre and post pandemic concerns? Definitely. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's important for us to have educators in Olympia who uniquely understand the needs of our students and our teachers. I think we need to be focused on how we're continuing to reinvest in our schools and how that funding is being distributed, right? We need to be moving away from a system that depends on property taxes and levies passed by local counties to fund our schools. We, this needs to be a statewide concern 
to ensure all, all schools are re receiving the funding they need based off of their needs, right? 1.2 nurses for a district with 12 schools just doesn't make sense. I agree with Representative Mossbrecher, right? We do need infrastructure investment for things like rural broadband. We see our students need that when they're learning from home. Additionally, beyond just funding, we need to think about how we're enforcing punishment. We've seen too much disproportionate suspensions of students of color all across the state and within our own district, looking to have consequences that are restorative and supportive to support our student bodies rather than punitive. Thank you, Mr. Q. We will now begin with questions that were submitted by the public. We are now in wildfire season. If elected, how can you work at the state level to help our communities reduce the threat of wildfire and smoke? We'll begin with Mr. Q. Thank you so much. This is so crucial as we all are experiencing right now with the smoke we're handling, the fires in our district all over the West. I think there's two prongs, right? There's local, what we're doing to prevent, how we're supporting people to be able to make sure that their homes are defensible spaces, making sure that we have those resources in the community to support our firefighters, support our fire crews who are looking to do prescribed burns, to manage our force, what that policy is. And the other one is we need to be acting now to address the climate crisis. This is bigger than a fire season. This is a long time coming. People have been paying attention are not surprised by this happening. We need to be pushing to be drastically moving ourselves off of fossil fuels and towards those renewable energies that are gonna help avert the crisis of climate change that is all around us right now. It's hurting our lungs, it's hurting our communities, and we can help our economy be thriving, our agriculture be thriving for years to come by addressing climate change. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossberger, we're now in fire season, wildfire season. If elected, how can you work at the state level to help our communities reduce the threat of wildfire and smoke? Great, thank you. I think it has to do with education, really educating people on how to be safe. With this last batch of fires that we have, we just had a briefing recently with DNR. Uh, Hillary Franz is doing an amazing job as land commissioner. She's a Democrat. She's definitely leading in the right direction. I think what we need to know is that um, that we need to educate and let people know when they're human caused, if there's not lightning in the sky, right? And a lot of these, we don't see a lot of lightning. So these are human caused fires for the majority, for the most part. Let people know how to take care of a fire at a campground, how to make sure that people know if they're gonna do fireworks, that they use them in a safe area. I think we also need to incentivize our volunteer firefighters. Areas like ours, small ones, we have volunteer firefighters for the majority. The little town of Malden only had eight volunteer firefighters before it burned. And so we have to do everything we can to incentivize more to do it because they're always short. Maybe we can help them with different uh, insurance plans, pension plans, some incentive, even just pay for their cell phone. Something so that we can incentivize to make sure that they're Thank staying in contact much. with their family. Thank you very much. Our next question, uh, Ms. Mossberger, we'll start with you. By state law, county sheriffs are partisan positions. Would you support changing this to nonpartisan and why? I would check with the sheriffs in my district and then the sheriffs across the state through the Sheriff's Association and see if that's what they wanted because I serve them. Personally, I don't think it should be a partisan position. Our auditor isn't, our judges aren't. I think that um, partisanship in my experience gets in the way of really good policy. And I think it's one of those one positions that it's better to be neutral personally, but I would check with what my district wanted. That's who I serve. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Mr. Q, again, by state law, county sheriffs are a partisan position. Would you support changing this to nonpartisan and why? Yes, I do. I agree with Representative Mossberger. We do need to change that um, because I serve the needs of my whole community. And having a representative who might have political views that differ with that community is not fair. It's not representative of them. This is someone who needs to be protecting to serve our community. Um, and people shouldn't be worried that their political views, their ethnicity, their whatever is going to influence how they are treated by our sheriff's office. Um, and I serve all my constituents, not just the sheriff's union. Um, or those sheriffs. And so I'm talking to those in my community and hearing the call for reform on policing. And I think one place to start in our rural communities is pushing for nonpartisan sheriff's offices that are focused on supporting our communities. Thank you, Mr. Q. Next question. 
If you were to give advice to all of the kids watching, what would you say? We'll begin with Mr. Q. Yeah. Um, get active, get engaged. It has been such a pleasure um, over my career as a teacher to watch students, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, start getting involved in politics, making, making their voices heard, small stuff in their classroom, instituting changes of how their school runs, how their community runs, get involved. You have so much power, you have so much voice, make it heard. It just takes a little bit of encouragement, a little jump to get out there and start making your voices heard, right? You are our future. Um, your voices are the ones we need to be hearing. Um, don't wait for someone to tell you it's your turn because your turn's right now, right? We see young voices pushing for action on climate change, action on police reform, action on supporting our communities in a multitude of ways like health insurance and living wages, right? This is coming from the youth. Uh, we need you to keep pushing so we have a better tomorrow for you and all of our future generations. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossbrooker, if you were to give advice to all of our kids watching, what would you say? I love this question. I don't know who asked it, but I love this question. I think I would say live your dream. Uh, to be a state legislator at the Capitol was my dream. It was my dream job and I'm very grateful. So never give up, always push forward and always believe in your dream. My favorite song is uh, Humble and Kind by Tim McGraw. And it talks about just making sure that um, whenever you, you we, we, we love a lot of things in life. Life is about, we need to appreciate the great love that we have by having such a great life. And then we wanna make sure that at the all, same time, always turn around and open the door for the person behind you, right? Always make sure that that's part of your, your duty to make sure that you care for others and you're kind. Always, when you go across the bridge, always pay an extra dollar or $2 for whoever's in the car behind you. You know, just things like that, making sure that you do your part in community and, and build collaboration instead of divide. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Next question, what is your position on the state COVID-19 emergency proclamation? Ms. Mossberger, you are um, able to begin. Thank you so much. I think that the proclamation in the beginning was absolutely necessary. I think it was something that we had to do immediately. Um, Again, it's, it's really difficult to be a legislator leading through the fog in a pandemic with no roadmap. And the governor did a great job by stepping up and taking action to make sure that we were safe. I feel like it's um, gone on for a very long time. COVID's still going on, it's still active, but just really working together. Originally, I was on a task force. There were eight of us who got to discuss which business could, could open safely. Like maybe the, the maintenance guy who pushes a lawnmower by himself, he, does, he's, he can open his business, he can still earn money for his family. So we're just making sure that we, we do everything we can so that I do think it's a good idea. I do think we have to have discussions about how to safely open before the economy is unable to come back. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Mr. Q, what is your position on the state COVID-19 emergency proclamation? I support the emergency proclamation. We need to put the health and safety of all of our community members first. Um, we've seen examples throughout our country, across the globe, those states, those regions who acted swiftly um, and with a high level of seriousness have been able to reopen quicker with fewer recurrences and less economic impact. So we need to keep our foot on the gas, keep working hard as a community to come together, support each other, keep those vital infrastructures running, keep money in the hands of our community, um, but really make sure we're taking care of people. Um, looking at things like how we can in schools be bringing students with the highest need back, addressing those things and being creative, but we have to be listening to the advice to the CDC, our governor's office, to support our community, to keep each other safe, and make sure that we're able to bounce back stronger than we ever were. Thank you, Mr. Q. Our next question. Are the concerns of voters in your district being equally and adequately addressed across the political spectrum? Mr. Q, we will begin with you. No, I, I don't think so. You look at this district here, we've had 40 plus percent votes for Democratic candidates over the years. But for the last 30 years, we've been 100% Republican represented. And they are coming together on bipartisan issues. But if you look at the voting records, they're voting against addressing climate change. They're voting against living wages for our workers. 
there are so few counties where you can earn a living wage or on minimum wage. Even here in Washington, we have the highest minimum wage in the county, but it's just so hard. You have to be single without kids or married with kids, both working a minimum wage job. And we see these sorts of policies not being supported by our Republican representatives here. They're not addressing climate change. We need, they're not addressing healthcare in meaningful ways. They're voting against public options to support our communities. There are so many needs being left behind for our hardworking rural families that are not being addressed by our Republican representatives right now. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossbrooker, are the concerns of voters in your district being equally and adequately addressed across the political spectrum? I think that we are doing a good job. I think we can always do better. I think that listening to the people that we serve is key. And I have the opportunity every week to talk from one district to the other with a large group of people just about the things that they need, what we can do to get them more PPE during COVID. <coughs> Pardon me. Or what we can do. Um, I, the question is simply in each call, what can my office do for you? And it's a broad range of spectrum. They're telling us that there's a food bank coming up, a big food distribution from the USDA, or they're telling us that they need additional PPE or the occupancy of the hospital. Which I think communication is key. I think we're doing a good job, but I do think that, um, that Devin is right. We do need to listen more and we can always do a better job. Always ready for improvement. I love town halls. I love conversations like this. So this is where we get the answers we need to do a better job. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Our next question, how do you currently use science to inform your decision-making? Ms. Mossberger, we'll begin with you. I think science is key. I think we have to look at the science. Science is gonna determine the vaccine. It's gonna determine whether we're safe, whether we should even get a vaccine or not get a vaccine. It's gonna, I think the science is extremely important. The data is important. We're very blessed in this country to have great data systems that keep us right on key about what, what's coming next, how many cases we have, you know, how do we keep each other safe? Do we need to social distance? How far, what kind of mask do we use? I think the science behind it is, is absolutely key and we do need to listen to it. And I think that for the most part, the state of Washington is doing a good job doing that. There are some that do not and do not believe in COVID. And uh, it's frustrating for those that are trying to keep our family safe, ourselves safe and everyone we serve safe. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Mr. Q, how do you currently use science to inform your decision-making? Yeah, as a math teacher, uh, logic, science, those are the backbones of what I talk about with my students every day. Um, we have to be listening to our scientists, listening to our experts and vocally supporting them. Uh, as our politicians, people are looking to us to be those people who are in the rooms having those meetings and coming out and supporting their ideas and what they're saying about COVID, about climate change, about wildfires, you name it. We need to be active supporters of our scientists, spreading that message, using it in all of our decision-making and really making sure that we have rooms of experts in rooms chatting about what we need to be doing, what steps we need to be taking um, and addressing those community members who are gonna be impacted and figure out how we can make sure that it's supportive for our whole communities, but always using science as that driving force to inform our best practices in everything that we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Q. Our next question. Do you support replacing the Hood River White Salmon Interstate Bridge? If so, how will you make that happen? If not, why not? Mr. Q, you'll go first. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, this is a big one down here in the gorge for sure. Um, it's a big access point for us to get across. Um, and I think one of the big issues with the current bridge that needs to be addressed is the equity issue that you pedestrians and bicyclists can't cross it. Um, it's, that is limiting to people who need to find work in Hood River because of we don't have enough opportunities here um, or people coming back across. So making sure that we're working hard to make sure that's not a barrier to people in our community to be able to find work, um, to do the shopping that they need, to connect with the communities that they need um, and that we're able to have a communal area be able to go back across. I think the other big reason to be pushing to support to um, rebuild in some way, right? A new bridge that's gonna be able to make sure that our infrastructure are able to ship fruit and logs and all those other industries that need this bridge are able to do so safely, efficiently, and effectively. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossberger, 
Do you support replacing the Hood River White Salmon Interstate Bridge? If so, how will you make it to how will you help make that happen? If not, why not? Uh, absolutely, I support it. I think uh, it's critical to the bi-state work that we've done, and you've done a lot of that bi-state work too, so we really appreciate that. I think that uh, this is good timing for that question because there's a BUILDS grant, it's a transportation grant from Congress that just allocated $5 million to between Oregon and Washington to do just that, to talk about how we're gonna do that bridge and get that going. So good timing, and yes, I support it, and yes, so does Congress as of last week, I think. So we have $5 million to have those discussions and move it forward. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Our next question, what are the most pressing issues for the state legislature in the next session, especially for the upcoming general fund budget? Ms. Mossberger, you'll go first. The general fund budget has a $9 billion hole in it. And so it's gonna be very difficult with, for anything that has a fiscal note on it to pass. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to fill that hole first, and that's either going to happen with increased taxes, strategic cuts of programs, hopefully not across the board, and also the other option would be the federal government rides in on a white horse and pays it off, which I don't anticipate happening. Uh, priority has to be people's safety. It has to be public health. That's been at the forefront for this last you know, months and months, and that has to be the number one thing to make people safer. We can't even get 147 people back in that dome. So safety is, is number one. And then from there, we'll work into all the other many issues that are before us. Thank you, Ms. Mossberger. Mr. Q, what are the most pressing issues for the state legislature in the next session, especially for the upcoming general fund budget? Thanks, Tammy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Representative Mossberger. We need to prioritize health and safety, how we're addressing COVID, how we're supporting our communities, how we're supporting our local businesses and our agriculture. Another huge priority is how we're addressing equity in education, healthcare, and policing. We need these topics to be happening. There's so much going on, the climate crisis, so much thing, so many things happening. It's easy to get distracted, but we need to keep all these important issues on the top of the list. And right, we do have that big hole in our budget that needs addressing, and that's going to come from addressing our progressive tax structure. If you make $116,000 or less, you're paying over 10% of your income to sales tax, to property taxes here in Washington, $11,000. But if you're making over $250,000, you're paying around 4.7% of the state or $11,700. The wealthiest are not paying their fair share. We need to be looking at how we're reforming our tax structure to support our entire community. Thank you, Mr. Q. Next question. The COVID-19 emergency has greatly affected our healthcare system. In what ways can you work at the state level to help your constituents access affordable quality healthcare when they need it? Mr. Q, you'll go first. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've endorsed the plan for whole Washington health that looks at creating a universal healthcare system in the state of Washington. Um, our state legislator has been working hard. We just put the, um, they passed the public option uh, which will be coming into effect in 2021 to make sure that every citizen resident has an option for a publicly funded healthcare op choice, publicly supported, but we need to go further. By making a universal single payer, we're giving our state the ability to negotiate with those large pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, with the hospitals, and to make sure that we have the infrastructure investment, to make sure we have hospitals in the communities that we need them. Those corporations don't wanna put their resources into rural districts because there's not enough people. And so making sure that we have state funding, state emphasis on building that healthcare infrastructure is crucial to making sure that it's available and affordable, but also accessible to our entire community. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossberger, the COVID-19 emergency has greatly affected our healthcare system. In what ways can you work at the state level to help your constituents access affordable quality healthcare when they need it? A uh, great question, and of course, that's also at the forefront. The, the typical, the last study I saw, it was 42,000 to over 74,000 for one COVID patient without insurance. And we've got to address that. We've got to figure out how to pay that money back and make sure that they don't have that additional stress on top of it. What we're doing is we're doing a lot of work around um, private, the Medicaid program, making sure that if you have low income or cost that you can be, you can get your free testing. We're mandating that insurance companies mandate 
so that you can get tests for free, trying to keep people safe and doing what we can. Um, there's also COBRA, if you lose your job, as we saw, there were 1.4 million people that filed unemployment and those people, all, many of them are in the process of losing and most concerned about sometimes their healthcare. So we have a lot of work to do in that realm. It's definitely on the forefront and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that these systems are whole and these insurance companies take care of people that have been paying premiums. Thank you, Ms. Mossbrooker. Mr. Q, you have a challenge. Yeah. So Please, you have 30 seconds, sir. Thank you, Tammy. Great, I appreciate that we're working hard to address Medicaid in this time of crisis, but what are your plans for addressing healthcare and those needs of our community long-term when we're out of this crisis? It's not just right now, right? Healthcare is an issue for our constituents every day of the year, making sure that it's accessible, affordable for everyone living within our district and our state. Um, you voted against the public option, how do you plan on help fixing this broken health care system for our constituents if it's not the public option? Thank you, Mr. Q. Ms. Mossbrooker, you have 30 seconds to respond. Yeah, I think um, I wish I served on the health care committee because I know they've got a master strategic plan that I could share in detail. But I think that just really pulling everybody together and that'll be a priority. This COVID pandemic is new. It's something we didn't address in past sessions. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull in people and task force people who've had COVID, people who are on Medicaid, people who are, um, have no insurance at all, people that lost their job from, and now can't get on COBRA. We're going to pull all those people together and find solutions. I don't have the answers, but I'm going to find it in these large groups. And that's what we do with the legislature. Thank you. Ms. Mossberger, you have not used your challenge for this evening. Do you wish to use your challenge on any of the topics that we have spoken about this evening? Um, no, I'll just use it in closing. I think that was in the rules. All right, um, well, this really is the closing. So if you have any <laughs> others, you can do that. Otherwise I have one final question. Go ahead, finish right. your question if you like, absolutely. Okay. Our final question then for the evening. Um, please tell us why you are uniquely suited to fill this job. Ms. Mossberger, we'll begin with you. I'm uniquely suited because my heart is for people. And with the help of amazing smart people, around me and working with me and you know explaining what they need to me we've been able to do really great things i'm i got moved up to leadership i'm ranking member i've got positions within the legislature where i'm able to make big change which you've seen by legislation task force and projects that have come home so i feel like i am the right for me i'm called to do this work by god i, I live by faith so until he quits calling me i'm going to keep running and doing the people's work Thank you, Ms. Mossbrooker. Did you want to add anything else for your 30 seconds? I just think we have to work together. I, I thank my opponent for running for office. He's right in the fact that we have to engage. We have to get the next generation to engage and be part of it. I think we're doing a better job of that. We can improve. We can do a better job of it. I just, you know, I, I pray for all the people who are struggling. We're very blessed that it, the positions that all of us here watching tonight are in, but we have people who lost their homes in wildfires and we have people who lost loved ones due to COVID and that are really struggling homeless. I get to go to Yakima very shortly and, and go out on an outreach and visit and see what homeless need. There's so much work to do. It's an honor to do it and I'm happy. Thank you so much Thank for the you. event tonight. Thank you, Ms. Mossbrooker. Mr. Q, please tell us why you are uniquely suited to fill this job. Thank you so much, Tammy. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Really appreciate uh, the League of Women Voters and all of our sponsors, the Goldendale Sentinel, um, Mania Pioneer for helping put this on and make sure we have this opportunity to connect and discuss these really important issues facing our constituents. <clears throat> I'm not a career politician. I'm a high school teacher who's here to bring our community together to represent the voices of those people who work for small businesses in this district people who need access to healthcare, people who need an equitable education, right? To represent our entire community, everyone in here, um, and really making sure that we're bringing together and forming consensus, finding that time to build relationships, understand people's needs, and look for how everyone can be best served, not just big corporations, right? We need all of our policies to be working for every single one of our constituents, and make sure that our, everyone's basic needs are met, before we think about anything else. 
Thank you all so much. Muchas, muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Thank you, Mr. Q. And in the interest of, of fairness in time, did you have anything else you would like to add for the last 30 seconds to reply to Ms. Mossbrooker's closing statements? Uh, just my extreme gratitude for everyone coming out and engaging the political process. Vote, vote, vote. It's so important. Um, now is the time. We need to be working to address climate change, address health care, uh, and take care of everybody in our community. Um, and it's so important. And everyone here who's watching, your involvement uh, is so crucial. Talk to your friends, make sure people are registered, uh, get out the vote. This is an important election and I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Q. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our questions for the evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters and our sponsors, the Goldendale Sentinel and the Skamania County Pioneer, we want to thank both candidates for your participation tonight. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight's recorded coverage will be available on YouTube and on the League of Women Voters Facebook page. Please be sure to head, head to vote411.org if you need any other information. And please remember to mark your ballot and return it in time to be counted for the general election on November 3rd. The Postal Service recommends that voters mail their ballots at least one week prior to the election. Voters who choose to use the community ballot box drop, drop box, excuse me, should drop your ballots off by 8 p.m. on election day. Klickitat County has 11 ballot drop boxes and Skamania County has six ballot drop box locations. Please go to your county auditor's website for the exact locations. Again, thank you all for attending this evening and join us again next week for our forums with the Klickitat County Commissioner candidates for District 1 and District 3. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.